with this group, and in the future, Brian will be a lot of opportunities to do that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Al Ballard for the NRCS. Well, it's great to be here at the center. <laughs> the center of attention. Uh, my name is Alan Bauer. I'm the area rangeland specialist for Northern California. Um, and you know, basically, my position is I cover from Davis, Yellow County, up to the Oregon border. Uh, but uh, and I try to provide technical expertise mainly to the field offices and farmers and ranchers. But a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is really, uh, I'm going to focus a little bit on the conservation planning really quick. And yes, we do have programs that help offset a lot of the cost. But a lot of that is going to, uh, for those of you who are land managers, uh, landowners who might be interested in this, you'd be contacting the field offices directly. So they're the important ones, and I guess on the I guess a month ago I was on extension. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> there we go. So I want to start off with what, what we basically do with regards to conservation planning. You know, uh, going back, what was it, 75, 76 years ago now, you know, NRCS, Soil Conservation Service, was founded at, you know, with the Dust Bowl era and actually doing technical expertise and planning with landowners. And that's, that's still our foundation. That's, that's our base. And that's what we need to be still focused on. And it's, a, it's important that you know, we don't lose sight of that. Uh, as oftentimes when I was a planner up in Plumas County, and I, um, I would tell people that I worked with that you know, the conservation plan the technical expertise that we can give you is the, is the cake. The funding is the ice. So you have to put all those ingredients together before you can really get anything that's going to work with regards to funding. Um, so it's, you know, it's important that we remember that and that the conservation plan being the foundation um, to use the expertise, uh, not, but not just ours. You know, it's a multi-pronged approach. You know, we take information from UC, ARS, and then in our own, and put that together and say, you know, what is going to work on the land? And how is that going to work with regards to what the landowner's goals and objectives are? Why did they come in the door? Why are people interested? And obviously, within the context of this workshop, reduce the head, goat grass, weeds, things like that. Um, so we focus on SWAPO. What, what's that? Looking at what the soil, water, air, plants, animals, humans, and since um, I'm a little bit removed from conservation land, we now focus on energy. So I apologize for not having the E in there now. Um, but that's basically, we're looking at assessing conditions to improve, improve the quality of those resources. So we look at, I want to just briefly talk about the content, what the overarching practice is and how that relates into specific practices and make that distinction. So you won't find anything in the NRCS catalogs or, or um, definitions about what a key practice is. But that's more or less something that we look at as when sitting down with the landowner and, and finding out, okay, Medusa head, goat grass, weeds are a problem. What is the key practice or the most important practice or practices that are going to really improve and help that management system that they're currently doing on the, on, the, on the land? And the other thing is the practice which might have the greatest effect to make that improvement. What is, what is going to make that resource sustainable? Then we have, which is a little bit more um, something that you know our conservation planners and our field offices have, 
is accelerating practices. Now, I'm going to go into a little bit detail about what that is, but not more than five minutes. Um, but using to, what are, what are those accelerating practices that are going to directly improve the resource conditions and changes in management that cannot otherwise achieve the resource management goal? Okay? Or a facilitating practice, practice to enhance the ability to properly manage land under existing land use. And the management will also will improve as a result of that implementation. Okay? So briefly an example, such things for accelerating practices, things like range planting, brush management, prescribed burning, apparently when you can do it, and herbaceous weed control, which is why we're really here. Facilitating practices, fencing, water facilities, pipeline spring development. We saw that you know here on the on the research center. So, for example, again, for a facilitating practice, the offsite water, trot, piping systems, fencing, that's going to control break up the break up the pasture. Uh, example for herbaceous weed control that we've talked about so far, doing things such as chemical applications, biological applications, doing mowing, all those kinds of things. And then the big one, range seeding. Um, so this was a site that uh, Josh is familiar with and uh, our Glen County planners here, where it was kind of a you want to call it restoration, but a project that was, that was a site that was degraded, that um, was then the soil was improved and seeding was done with, uh, I think it was fertile grass, orchard grass, well, a lot of stuff that Josh had done uh, with, with your slides, looking at the, uh, uh, and, and I think it was fertile grass, hardy grass, and blue wild grass. Yeah, and blue wild grass. And you can see, I mean, it, there's no remnant of what was. And then there's the, you tie all that together with the management practice. It's not just a matter of going out and doing a scene and going out and doing, putting up fences. But how is the landscape going to be managed from there on after to be something sustainable? So configuring a um, fencing, configuring something that is really going to do, you know, achieve those goals and objectives. So reduce a head, far grow grass, that's your objective to get rid of those, what are you going to do that's going to be sustainable in order to not have a reinvasion? Now, there are programs, of course. I mean, I can spend the landowner's money like <laughs> no tomorrow. But you have to be realistic, too. And that's what we do have through the Farm Bill. But through our programs, we have funds available. And, you know, there's a you know, a half dozen to a dozen different programs that can help make that happen. Um, typically, the one most landowners are involved in is the EQIP program. Uh, we also have a conservation stewardship program, which is a little bit different, a little bit clunky as, as its relationship directly to the planning. But um, another one that I think we could also look a lot more at is the conservation innovation grant. So if the landowner really is trying to do something different that may not be specific, a specific practice or standard we have, something different, then we can do a little bit of a pseudo-research project and see whether or not that innovative, innovative uh, conservation practice can be applicable. Um, and just before I leave, I want um, those planners who are here in the audience, and I see a bunch of them, just raise your hand. Okay. Get a good look at all these people here, because those are the people you're going to be contacting ultimately, is in the field offices. I help the field offices, but they're the direct contact to the landowners within each of their counties. So it's really, it's really those people who are first line of information. Well done. The yeah, next speaker is Royce uh, Larson.
Or is it... Um, that's it. That's it, okay. So while he's pulling that up, Glenn mentioned he's uh, getting older and time is precious. And I'm not quite as old, but I'm getting there. And time is precious for me, but I'm also not too embarrassed to tell you something that didn't quite work the way we wanted it to. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Is it the arrow? Yeah. In 2000, well, about 15 years ago, Bill Whitecamp, who I replaced down there on the coast, realized that for the first time, the Parkville area had Medusa gas. And then when I got there and we were working with the rancher, and he wanted to know what can I do about it. And I work a lot with Carl Street, who couldn't be here today. And he was going to tell the equip side of this talk, but uh, since he's not here, I'll try to cover it. We went in and did a little demonstration, and I'm not going to say it was a, exper uh, you know, a replicated experimental research. We just wanted to demonstrate some of the practices that we already knew, which we've talked an awful lot about today, that of burning, spraying, and fertilizing with grazing. So we picked an area on a branch near Parkfield and set up just some plots there so that we could actually take a look at these different methods. And the purpose was not to learn perhaps new science, although that's always fun, but more to take it to an equip level and, and take it to a larger area on the ranch and try to apply it. So we set this up, you know, used Roundup, we used uh, fertilizer, and then we wanted to burn. Okay, the trouble with burning. It took uh, Cal Fire, which was CDF at that time. We wanted them to come at the peak time to burn, which we've all talked about today, and they made it in August. <laughs> nice. So that's one problem. <laughs> then when they did come and burn, it jumped the line and burned all of them. <laughs> so that really kind of messed us up in terms of looking at these different treatments to begin with. However, one of the, the areas that we had fertilized really showed a, a big increase in bird clover. We didn't even know it was in that understory of the Medusa cat. And it jumped up, and it just about completely took out all the Medusa cat. And so we felt like fertilization might be the way to go. And the rancher worked with Carl and got an equip program going. And, and I wasn't part of the discussion on how much to do and so on. But they chose to fertilize 350 acres. So this is a 14,000 acre ranch. Emilio topped 1 to 3%. This is reaching that 3% area of the ranch. They, we got it fertilized. Um, that year was a high rainfall year and very good production. That's been mentioned here several times. Um, not only from the rainfall, but then from the fertilization. He could not get his cattle bunched enough to utilize that and take advantage of that on 350 acres. So, so the control to that was it was just way too much of an area to be able to get the control that we wanted. And though it did about a third of that that we fertilized help reduce Medusa head for three or four years, or two or three about, it's all back. You wouldn't even know where we, where we used the treatments today. But the other question was, I talked to the rancher, and they said, uh, I asked him very directly, would you do this again? And without hesitation, he said, no. And then he said that I've got two reasons. One, the fertilization is too cost prohibitive. That's using an equip cost share program. He felt that it did, he did not get an advantage enough to cover those costs. And the other, to him, it was a roll of the dice. So we, we can't control the weather, the climate. And I've been in this area now for 15 years. And not only is there a different amount of rainfall every year, but it comes at a different timing every year. And so he's right. There, it's all over the board. Uh, if you look at the, uh, it's really interesting that 
since January 1 to right now, we right now we are at the driest time since 1870 in this particular area. And if you look at the predictions for this coming year, you have three to choose from. One is below average rainfall, another is right at average, and another is above average. <laughs> so you choose the person you want to listen to. You should be a weatherman. <laughs> So that's, that's my comment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well said. Our next uh, speaker here is Carrie Cuban Rivers, uh, manager of the Audubon Bobcat Ranch.
There's another one that we have, uh, FIRE. Uh, we are currently working through VMP, um, paperwork's going through. The guy that I was working with at Cal FIRE transferred to another area, so that's made it really complicated for me. We had a great working relationship for two dry years. We've been pushed on the back burner both years um, when we were signed up this spring because of, because of the numbers of FIRE. So you can see the pictures from John Anderson, thank you, and his property here. And, um, winters, we did, they did a, this is a 100 acre burn, the first burn that they did up at, um, it was really well controlled, you're right, you're, uh, you can see in the top picture there, you have, uh, goat grass, and I'm really interested to see, he just, we just did this burn in June, and I'm really interested to see what happens with the seeds, um, Cages I heard. So, like walking through the grass, and there's a bird. We're looking at birds. We are out of one of them. Um, we're looking at the density and cover of the plants, and you can see this is all the medusa head she's in with the thatch. And I found a lot to come up too tall. They're covered. Um, so, you can put this down to look out and put this, you know, kind of walking through what the level of sight the bird can actually hide from. It, so. um, and this is a, this is one plot four years we've been doing through NRCS. Um, we started setting up a monitoring program. This is um, what we call our maximum flat area that has been, prior to this burn, it was done in 2004, 5, and 6 in three different areas. We planted about 100 acres of um, perennial grasses, um, basically a native grass seed mix from Hedgerow Farms. And we did a burn in 2007, and that was the monitoring picture, so that's what I had to work with. Um, 2008, or sorry, 2000, sorry, 2010, 2013. That's 2010 in the top, 2011. On the top right, um, you can see a lot of Medusa had came back in um, the following year. 2011, you see the thatch I have down there, um, pretty intense. And then this is this year, 2013. I grazed it pretty hard this year, built the entire flat, uh, mowed it down pretty low, tried to uh, take advantage of the dry spring this year um, so that I could break up the thatch and get rid of some of the seed bank. Um, perennials are well established. Uh, they'll come up, the root system will so love it this year. You can get down a little deeper. So I'm going to see what happens next spring. Um, I'd like to go on a curbside application, um, possibly uh, cover you know some of the larger plots. I'm not sure. Um, so that's pretty much it. Some of the folks that we've worked with have been NRCS. Um, we've worked with uh, UC Property Extension on, on a bunch of projects. Tomorrow morning, uh, talk about a little. I'm um, Davis on multiple other projects too. So that was that was super great. But our, our main uh, our main goal for the ranch um, is to do economically feasible conservation practices, which to me means landscape level, not um, looking at small plots. It's something that we can do that's replicable for um, other ranchers and farmers. It's really important to get larger scale things going. So I'm looking forward to doing projects with um, Jeremy and other folks around to actually look at larger scale. Okay, the last speaker for this segment is Justin Wages. We're going to set up here. I didn't really have a big fancy slideshow. 
just one little piece of paper, so I thought I'd just give you guys a, an example of real world constraints that I have to deal with as a land manager. Uh, we have one particular preserve down in the Lincoln area. It's mostly, it's a 426 acres comprised of mostly uh, little pool grassland habitat bisected by a small friend of the stream. We acquired it in 07 when we started managing it. Prior to that, it had uh, what I would consider improper grazing management. Um, I think there were like 10 or 15 cows on the whole thing, and there were no fencing except for boundaries. So you can imagine them running around picking up the candy. And it's, it was completely infested with the goose head, um, such that you know my joke is like walking out there, if I didn't pick up my feet, if I drug my foot, I'd have Medusa head thatch up my knee. You know, just terrible. So our first study out there, I want to say the high plot was around 6,000 pounds um, per acre, uh, which is pretty insane. And that was pretty much anything, all that was growing. Um, so we contracted with a grazier, had him come out and start a grazing management program. Predominantly, since there wasn't a whole lot of feed, was to get the hoof action classification to break down that thatch. Uh, we did actually do, uh, we do surveys every other year out there. Um, I call them surveys and not studies because they are definitely not UC level robustness. Um, but uh, we did, you know, plot all the differences and. As you can see here, well, you can't see if you look on the back of that paperwork I have. This guy right here is your Medusa head. And I want to say we were up somewhere in the 50%, 40%, something like that. Um, pretty high. Some of these, and that was only because there were a couple plots that were randomly chosen that had almost nothing. Most of them were actually in the 70 to 80% range for these plots. And these plots are 10 meter by 10 meter, um, so pretty large. Um, and then what we are finding is with uh, really good targeted grazing or rotational grazing, we set up the electric fences, we can get that stuff beaten into the ground, the cows would eat it, deplete the seed bank. By 2009, um, which would be the, the next one on the page, um, we actually saw a 10% decrease in the news ahead. And what we are finding is um, some of the other animals that are a little more desirable, um, like the uh, Obia and the soft chest, soft chest especially, um, were coming up to compensate. We also had a lot more forbs that were popping up. For the first time, you know, in a couple of years, we were seeing big fields, the frying pan poppy and things like that. Brodias were, were so prolific, I mean, they barely take steps out there without crushing. So uh, it was pretty awesome. Uh, the problem is, and what I alluded to earlier, is that, you know, 420 something acres, if you only have 50 head of cattle, you go from no feed, no feed, and all of a sudden in March, everything just explodes. And you have Medusa head and forage everywhere. What are you going to do? You know, I don't have enough cattle. I can't make those instant cattle. And until you guys figure out at the sea level how to make them hibernate, so I can just stick them in the barn, <laughs> right, and then just pull them out when I need in the spring, I'm stuck. So all we should do at that point is concentrate on certain areas of the ranch, uh, in particular like where the vernal pools high quality pools are, I tend to tell the rancher to concentrate the cattle there. And what we're finding is, um, I had some changes in grazing tenants, uh, and then kind of a new learning curve. And what was happening is, during that period where we didn't have that high intensity grazing, not quite as high as he's talking about, but um, what we're having is that the uh, producer was coming back, and same with the fast level. So it only takes two, three years to um, so, like, when I had Jeremy come out there this year, it was kind of embarrassing. It was like somebody walking in their house who hadn't had time to clean it. Um, it was like, no, oh, this did look better at one point. Um, so you have to keep up on it. So we got the new grazing planted in there, and we're concentrating on, say, the north side of our preserve. And anecdotally, because I haven't done another uh, survey out there, is you can visually see the Medusa head levels are still really low uh, in comparison to the rest of the preserve, which I've looked at as a sacrifice because the vernal pools weren't as great, that sort of thing. So what we're looking at now to make up for the fact that we don't have the instant cattle that I want, uh, and I'm not forest gump, I'm not going to run around a little riding mower, you know, for that 400 acres, then jump to my next preserve, which is 500 and then 1800. I got to come up with different ways to make this work. So much like Carrie is doing, um, I harness uh, the whip grain from NRCS, as well as a uh, Partners Fish and Wildlife Grant, um, Fish and Wildlife Service. 
and we were doing uh, grassland uh, restoration or rehabilitation uh, tournament uh, in a small section, but that's so expensive that there's no way I can do the full, full 420 solid acres, and I can't take it out of production because I have a raising tent. You know, he needs to be able to utilize it. So what we did is we put up, uh, used the extra money to put up fencing along the right barren area and to create five more paddocks out of a 200 acre parcel. So even though I couldn't directly go in and seed that, I can increase my uh, pressure with those livestock in those areas and try to keep those batch levels down and keep those, even if they're not perfect natives um, or any native, they're just beneficial to wildlife like the soft, the soft chest and beneficial to the livestock, I'm still doing better with the benefits. So in a nutshell, what I think we need to do is try to find out what these constraints are. Well, we kind of know what the constraints are. Uh, but figure out ways that we can utilize a little bit of things here and there from that toolbox, whether it be the fire, the herbicide, the livestock, um, using the grants to put the infrastructure in, like the watering. That's a huge one. Um, I can't tell you how many times I had to let them into my riparian area just to get some water this last season. Um, and then utilize them as we can. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do out there, and hopefully it'll work this next year. Thank you, okay, I just want to take a minute and check in. We just saw some really great examples of trying to scale some of these efforts uh, to an operational level. Who wants to add to this? I'd like to just ask the group, what's the largest area of people have used herbicide on? Maybe close to 20 acres or something? We're talking about. I've been in projects about a thousand acres. A thousand. land. A couple hundred acres before a restoration project. My air. Good question. Um, anybody else? You don't want to screw up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Um, Anybody else want to add to this scaling oh, idea? I just, well, yeah, I just have a question for folks that are actually doing the work out there. When stuff starts to go bad, does it go bad from the outside in, the stuff coming in, or is it just seed banks and or plants that, you know, these are weeds, and if they get a competitive vacuum, the, the next year they're just like, yeah, they'll pump out seed too. I'm just wondering, is it variable? Because it seems like managing this, because, I mean, I'm hoping that it's mostly from the outside, because that seems like, wow. And if you just do a big scale thing, you just have to battle around the edges. But I got a bad feeling that it's also from the inside, too. I mean, there's the seed banks and so. Good question. Any comments on that? Where, where, where is the uh, come? Well, I think Kevin is both. Well, yeah. I no, 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 I don't mean that flippantly. I think that yeah. you can, there are some factors that things like weather and other things out of, outside of your control and also the the dispersion from inside, but then all these sites we've been talking about have a tremendous amount of small scale internal variability where you aren't going to get a uniform result, and so you have always a lot of pockets that are working well, so, inside so, out. So, so Jamie, I think it's that's, both. that's what I worry about because if that's the case, that I mean, then that's a bigger, much bigger problem because it's basically you have you know invasion from the inside, and that's really tough to deal with, and so then it's, it's more like you have to work at trying to set up competitors with it, as opposed to just, we'll make it really, really big, and so the dispersal from the outside will be really low. It seems like you have to structure it, you have to build these things so they're armored then from the inside. Yeah, I think it does differ for the two species, though. I think Medusa is a much bigger inside-out problem because yeah. of the, the size and ability to disperse very rapidly at the middle, at the middle scales. Whereas with goat grass, you have pockets inside that the dispersal is slower, and so it can be a little bit more, more huh. controllable. But I, I do think that the, the answer is both are a problem, and they've always been a problem. It's not as though this is just arisen. No. <laughs> 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 I, I think my problem personally at Bobcat is that we historically had dairy heifers out there who don't cover landscape very well, and we have neighbors with um, you know, 40 to Thank you. 
done like that for 15, 20 years, like really negatively, and I think it disturbs the soil big time. I mean, like we were talking about earlier, the, the makeup of the soil will actually change. So um, that, that, that's an inside problem. That's something we're working on. But that's winter grazing, and that's part of the problem of not having water established. You end up in most of these foothills perpetuating the issue with these plants because you're not grazing at the right time. And you pull off, there's no competition for these plants. They just take off. Anybody want to add to that? Yeah, Jeremy, uh, Carrie brought up a really good point, which is the land that is not seen or managed for production or conservation, uh, particularly talking about uh, rural residential and agriculture training and so on. And those are big sources of progress and reduce ahead. So I think we need to involve the community to deal with managing those lands, which are, uh, I don't know, uh, real estate people and county. Mm -hmm. uh, people uh, make them aware of the, of the issue. Uh, that, that's the bad news. The good news is that there's a lot more labor per unit area. I have one one specific case in which they told me once they were horrified about the amount of use that they had. I said, why did you do this and this and that? The next year I called them right before it was time to choose just to remind you. And they said, oh, it's all gone. I mean, they just pulled it all. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, so so uh, uh, I think we need to try to engage that community. Yeah, really I think one thing uh, to think about is that really managing a, an artificial biome in our black landscape. So it, it balances the desirable versus undesirable is kind of an artificial construct that we're creating ourselves because we're not restoring the original California grasslands per se in most cases. And these weeds are going to come and go uh, you know, over time. So that's, we think we're in control, but we're trying to do a balancing act with an artificial mind. Something that a lot of people don't understand, uh, I think most ranchers do, but the time it takes for a native grassland to become established after seeding. Now, a lot of people want to see it in three or four years. Uh, but I've been doing it for 20 years now and have followed many of the Nature Conservancy and Fish and Wildlife Service uh, programs. It is five, six, seven years before you really see the final product start to reseeding itself. The bunch grass is getting big enough to outcompete things in between. So that time thing is something that, uh, uh, you know, the, the small plot in two or three years is, is, is great for scientific purposes, but that, to understand that you have to wait is something that you all should think about. I think one thing that I meant to add was uh, the importance of the graziers um, understanding all of the issues that we're having so they can come in with, um, you know, an educated stance. One, they're going to have to compete other bidders, uh, most likely, if they you know, have that knowledge. But um, for like, for me, it would be a lot easier if I can do a long-term lease with someone that's going to be responsible and totally understand the system. And they have uh, the ability then to put in the infrastructure and take ownership of that place, much like as if it was their own land. Um, it's most likely, uh, it's less likely to then be you know, stripped like some of these short-term leases that occur uh, and thwart some of our efforts. You know, we can do everything we want to do, plant all the grasses we want, but if you get an irresponsible or unknowledgeable leaseholder out there, they rape and pillage your land, well then with all your work and possibly your government money. Let's take one more from Carrie and then we'll move on. No. I was going to
Okay, so we're going to bring things to a close here, but end with really the most important part of our day. And I know we live in a time where everybody, you guys are off to the next thing. Everyone here drove a really long way to get here. We appreciate your time. The presenters today, they drove from a long way. We've all dedicated a lot of time uh, to today. I know we didn't get through everything, but I think the most important thing that we can take home today is this last synthesis. And we're going to ask these groups at each table, so each, each table consists of a group, to provide a very brief response to two questions. And they're on this page here. The first one is, what are your three major take-home points for today? The second question is, how do you recommend we move forward in the future? Okay, those aren't necessarily easy to answer, but what I'd like these groups to do is take a few minutes, take five minutes to synthesize, and we're going to ask one person from each group to present 